A raging, fast-moving wildfire explodes across Southern California. Nearly two dozen homes destroyed. How the record drought is fueling the flames. A grim and tragic milestone in American history. One million lives lost to the COVID pandemic. Tonight, President Biden honors the deaths, saying the virus has forever changed the country. The virus that left 250,000 children without at least one parent. Healthcare workers stretched thin and exhausted by an unimaginable wave of patients. Now a warning, this pandemic is not over yet. Subpoenas for five sitting Republican lawmakers in a new rare move by the January 6th committee. What it means for House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Congressman Jim Jordan and the others. Jonathan Carl standing by. It's been 12 days since the death of country music superstar Naomi Judd. In a deeply personal, painful and powerful sit down interview with Diane Sawyer, her daughter Ashley shares the struggles and joy of her legendary mother's life. When you're talking about mental illness, it's very important to, and to be clear and to make the distinction between our loved one and the disease. After decades of neutrality, an unprecedented move by Finland with a request for NATO membership without delay. The country borders Russia and the Kremlin has given a response and a warning. Representation on stage and on the screen. The tide is turning in the entertainment world, placing Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander stars at the forefront. It's been so wonderful to see so many brown skinned children come to the show and really be at the edge of their seat because they see themselves represented for the first time on stage. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with a somber and heartbreaking milestone. Two years ago, it was hard to imagine that one million American lives would be lost to COVID-19. And today, that is our reality. To put that number in perspective, the population of the entire state of Delaware is just under one million. And the number only rises when we talk about the grief-stricken and heartbroken loved ones that they leave behind. It's estimated that at least nine million people suffered the loss of a family member killed by COVID. Today, President Biden ordered flags across the country at half staff. Biden said, we all must do more. We must honor those we have lost by doing everything we can to prevent as many deaths as possible. So tonight, we honor those lives. And we remember the frightening early days when a steady stream of sirens rang out, piercing the silence of otherwise empty streets here in New York and across our country. We remember the field hospitals, the patients in isolation, the families denied visits, the many who died alone without the familiar face, touch, or goodbye from loved ones. We remember our fearless medical workers who worked tirelessly and continue to put themselves in harm's way. And we remember the hope brought by the scientists who helped create the vaccines, which have slowed but not stopped the suffering. While we have not come out of this crisis just yet, as we move forward, we want to shine a light on a hidden toll, America's orphans of COVID, the more than 250,000 children who lost their parents. World News Tonight anchor David Muir reports. 5.30 in the morning, A.J. Ariano arrives at school, football practice, in honor of his dad. I just know that he's watching me. It helps me with playing better, you know? 5.45 a.m., Trey Burroughs, is about to leave for work. This is like actually happening to us. 6 a.m., his sister Jenny up two. They are now raising their two sisters, hoping to make their mother proud. On this day, Jenny gets the girls to school. Across this country, the young people showing their resilience. Kylie Coney walking down the hallway in high school. Everything happened so suddenly and so fast. Her brother Colton with his backpack, life without their dad. Cornelia Bell getting on the school bus, a first grader, now without her mother and her father. Four-year-old Elsie, two-year-old Graham, out the door before the sun comes up, barely old enough to remember their father. For months now, we have witnessed the quiet strength of the children facing a new day without a parent. More than 250,000 children here in the U.S have lost a parent or a primary caregiver in this pandemic. Kylie and Colton's dad was always so proud. All right, Colton! A big birthday girl. On this day in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, Colton is about to honor his father. You got a big game today, huh? <laughs> yeah. Are you nervous? Uh, a little bit. Your dad was a big hockey guy. Yeah. What's been the hardest part for you? Not 
being able to see him every day. Like, it was always good waking up and seeing him. His sister Kylie, down the hall. Do you find yourself still talking to your dad? Sometimes I'll text him, and I think that that helps me. Do you still text him? Yeah, it's like my way of communicating. It is bittersweet because I know I'm not going to get a reply back. The sunset she sent her father. What did he say? Thank you for the beautiful sky. I miss you. Oh. Yeah. Did you know your mom has been doing the same thing? No, I did not. <laughs> yep. You caught me. A mother in the hallway listening. I started sleeping on his side of the bed because I couldn't bear rolling over at night and seeing that empty spot. And in the morning, you know, tell him I'm ready to start the day and do the best that I can as, as a mom, and then I'll take care of our kids. May he be proud. I hope, I hope so, yeah. Upstairs, Colton getting ready for hockey. His father's Rangers hat right there on Colton's dresser. And his father's pins, his rings. His father was a Marine. One of his favorite hats, and then pins and necklaces and rings from the Marines. I heard you got his flag. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a tough moment? Yeah. Definitely. We hear about the numbers, but rarely do we see the moment a child says goodbye to their parent. We accept this flag as a token of appreciation for your loved ones faithful and all of your service. Colton was just 12. His hand reaching for his father's flag. Happy birthday, dear Their father, Eric Coney, died at just 51. He and his wife both had COVID. And Eric died the day they got the call saying the vaccines were now available for them. Colton now heads out the door for the hockey game his father would have loved. How are the pregame nerves? Uh, a little nervous. A little nervous? Um, All right. His mother on the other side of the fence. One, two, three, go. Let's go, let's go. In Boynton Beach, Florida, Trey Burroughs and his siblings starting another day without their mother. I wake up at 5.30, take a shower, and then hopefully I have a little bit of time to read my Bible and eat a bit of food. I'm studying to become a firefighter. Cindy Dawkins, a single mother of four, died from COVID. She had been afraid of the vaccine. Once I got the news, which was over the phone, um, like obviously I cried and I was super sad. And my mind went to my sisters. How are we gonna like make sure we all stay together? Found out she had COVID one day. The next day she was gone. Jenny and her brother Trey are now the parents. We're making good time this morning. She fixes Sierra's makeup. Okay. Perfect. Zoe getting ready to becoming parents has been difficult. I had a hard time admitting that I felt kind of guilty because I felt very like tired, stressed out, just wanting to be by myself sometimes. It is okay. Yeah. And who's looking out for you? <sighs> Honestly. <laughs> it's a lot. And in our months following these children, we notice something else. Every day, Jenny and her mother's necklace. I don't feel right not wearing it. I've worn it every day since I got it from the hospital, so. She was wearing that when she went to the hospital? Yeah, yeah. This is the first thing that they handed to me. And ever since then, I've had it. Every one of these children carries their parent with them. It's 5 a.m. and A.J. Ariano is up. He knows that's what his father would have wanted. He's off to football practice. So it's 5.24 in the morning. His father, Alan, was just 49. He'd had his first shot of the vaccine, and he was waiting on the second. Part of why you're here is your dad, right? Yeah, definitely. Do you think about him every day? Every day, especially when I wake up. 
Oh, it's yeah. been nine months now without his father. Before every game, you go to the sideline? Yeah, right over there. And what do you do? Well, I say a little prayer, and I talk to my dad just like I would. Before every game, he'd give me a, he'd give me a phone call, so I just act like I'm on the same phone call, and I just hear him talking back with me. We still hear his voice. Yeah, definitely. On the Shakta Reservation in Mississippi, Take your phones. the scope of the loss Bye -bye. is devastating. The little girl who lost both parents, my Lindy Bell, now raising her seven-year-old niece, Cornelia DeRose. Where's your jacket and your mask? Her parents, Craig and Mindy Bell, died just three months apart, both getting COVID before the vaccines were ready. That's Melinda in the blue jacket, and that's Tashta in the black jacket. They're my mom and daddy, but they died. <sighs> and my Lindy is about to bring her niece to the COVID memorial on the reservation. They made this cross for those that passed from COVID. So like Mamo and your mama, they did this in honor of them. Let's honor them. Like honoring people, you know, because they've passed the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians dedicated to those, the lives of those lost to the COVID-19 pandemic. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. As we document these families, the turning points. Feeling so excited. Six months after losing their mother, they are now packing. With their two jobs and money raised by a mom from school, Janie Yoshida on GoFundMe, they are now about to move into their first house, their mother's dream. She always wanted a house for us, so I know she's probably ecstatic right now. So you made dinner already for tonight? Yes, so that So sure. what is dinner? Um, baked chicken and rice, white rice. I might have to stay a little longer. <laughs> as part of his training, we watch as Trey returns from a call with the Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue Station 65. And we go to find him after the test. So how'd it go? Yeah, you passed the first one? Yes, sir. You feeling good? Yeah. All right. The smile says it all. <laughs> Turning points for all of the families. Cornelia about to make the honor roll. Cornelia, Trey Rose, Bay. And the speech Kylie is about to give for her father. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kylie Coney. Going back to school was and still is the most challenging thing I ever had to conquer. This year, my brother decided to join hockey. We are slowly learning to find happiness in our lives again. Perhaps sharing can let other families know, let other children know that they are not alone. Thank you. Some resilient families there are thanks to David for that. Our coverage of one million deaths continues tomorrow and throughout the next week right here on ABC News Live. Next tonight to the dramatic escalation in the investigation of the Capitol riot. The House Committee has now issued subpoenas to five Republican congressmen, including GOP leader Kevin McCarthy, who says the probe is not legitimate. Jonathan Carl reports. In a highly confrontational and virtually unprecedented move, the January 6th committee today subpoenaed five Republican members of Congress, including GOP leader Kevin McCarthy, who could soon become the Speaker of the House. All five had refused to cooperate. McCarthy unwilling to testify about the phone conversations he had with President Trump while the attack on the Capitol was underway. Back on January 6th, McCarthy told ABC News that he pleaded with Trump to give a national address calling on his rampaging supporters to stand down. I, I, I begged him to go talk to the nation. Four days after the riot, McCarthy was caught on tape telling fellow Republicans he'd had it with Trump. I've, I've had it with this guy. Uh, what he did is unacceptable. Um, nobody can defend that and nobody should defend it. But soon after, McCarthy was back to being one of Trump's staunchest supporters as he is today. Quite a reversal there. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. John, how is McCarthy responding tonight? 
McCarthy was peppered with questions on Capitol Hill about whether or not he will comply with the subpoena. Lindsay didn't directly answer yes or no, uh, but he repeated his attacks on the committee as being a partisan committee and saying it was using its investigation to go after its political opponents. So it doesn't sound like a yes, but again, no direct answer yet. All right, we'll have to see. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you as always. Thank you, Lindsay. Now to that California wildfire that burned through a coastal neighborhood in just a matter of hours. After years of drought, fire season is now virtually any time of year. Families had only moments to prepare before their homes were fully engulfed. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports. That firestorm tearing through this neighborhood in California's Orange County. Firefighters bracing against the blast furnace heat as homes and cars explode in flames. The fire breaking out in Laguna Niguel just after 2.30 Wednesday afternoon. At least 20 houses destroyed, many others damaged. This goes on for house after house. All that's left is the smoldering wreckage in so much of this place. We saw one of the residents, Ritz Sherman, surveying the damage. Well, there's a lot of people in this community, I know. They lost everything. We look around, yeah. I just can't imagine, yeah. Officials predicting we'll see more freak fires like this. With the climate change, the fuels beds are so dry that fire like this is going to be more commonplace. Some scary images there are thanks to Matt Gutman. A major move by Finland tonight. The Scandinavian country, which shares hundreds of miles of border with Russia, is seeking to join NATO. This comes despite warnings from Russia and its complicated past of neutrality since World War II. Inez de la Quetara reports for us tonight from Helsinki. Tonight, a major decision by one of Russia's Western neighbors seeking to join the world's most powerful strategic alliance, NATO. We are convinced that Finland would bring added value to NATO. We would like to maximize our security in way or another while thinking uh, membership in NATO. After years of neutrality, Finland announcing in a statement NATO membership would strengthen Finland's security Finland must apply for NATO membership without delay. Finland may be the world's happiest country on the surface, but deep underground, painful reminders of the past. It's a long way down, but we are heading beneath the capital city of Helsinki to visit what looks like it's right out of a Cold War spy novel. This is what's known as the underground city. You've got this massive network of tunnels and bunkers that spreads out all across the city. It's a network that's been slowly expanding since the end of World War II. And you now have enough bunkers to house more than the city's total population. More than 5,000 bomb shelters in Helsinki, over 50,000 in the entire country. Here, all buildings above a certain size are required to have their own bunkers. So these are the types of beds that would be used in the event of an emergency, these bunk beds right here. You've also got the bathrooms already set up and they've got ventilation up there. With so much ground going unutilized, the city converting some of these shelters into spaces for everyday public use. There's an underground playground, a shelter that doubles as a hockey rink, and beyond these two sets of massive blast-proof doors. So the first door is like a pressure door. Even an underground swimming pool. We are more than 55 feet below ground right now. This bunker has been repurposed into a swimming pool. You can see it's been carved out of the rock here, and it can house up to 3,800 people. So we have 72 hours. We empty this big pool. So you would empty out the pool. It takes one to two days to empty yeah. out the pool. And then people would sleep where yeah. the pool is. Yeah. And you have fresh water supplies for, for three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. This is what it's like being Russia's neighbor. The two countries sharing an 800-mile border and a long, complicated history. For decades, Finland had opted not to join any military alliance, an effort meant to appease Russia's security concerns. As a result, Finland had to ensure it could fend for itself. And we have to take care of the citizens. And that's the main, main reason that we, we have this kind of system. So it's not just the bunkers. Conscription is still mandatory for men, and the country has about 900,000 reservists. And that's why Russian uh, can't come here, because we are so strong here. <laughs> There's a historic sense that you should always be prepared. 
it might not be this generation or the next generation, but Russia is likely to attack Finland in some way. But the very scenarios Finland has spent years preparing for now playing out in Ukraine, where some have been living underground for weeks. The invasion marking a turning point for relations between Finland and Russia. What are Finland and Russia's relations now? Effectively, they have never been as bad. Public support in Finland for joining NATO skyrocketing from roughly 30 percent before the war to a record high of more than 70 percent in its aftermath. We have a so horrible neighbor on the east side of Finland. We, have, uh, we don't have any other option than go to NATO. Finland's parliament will now take up the issue and hold a vote in the coming days. Neighboring Sweden is expected to follow suit. As for NATO's response... Uh, Finland and Sweden will be warmly welcomed and expect the process to go uh, quickly. Finland's accession would more than double Russia's land border with NATO. It would also expand NATO's influence in the Arctic and further unify the West. NATO would also grow stronger. NATO would now have two more old democratic countries, both with really capable militaries, so that effectively all of Northern Europe would now be one region to defend. But there are those that are skeptical. Veronica Honkinsalo is one of the few members of parliament who doesn't think Finland should join. I'm afraid that the NATO membership will increase actually the tensions in the Baltic Sea region and also will increase the tensions in Finland, especially regarding the eastern border. Russia responding to Finland's announcement, threatening to take retaliatory steps to stop threats to its national security. Earlier this week, Russian President Putin once again justifying the war in Ukraine by saying NATO had created an absolutely unacceptable threat to Russia. He has for years said Finland and Sweden joining is a red line. Finns say now is the time to act while Putin is busy with Ukraine. There are concerns, though, about what could happen after Finland and Sweden apply, but before they formally become a part of the alliance. The two countries now trying to win over security assurances from allies, the UK already formally announcing to stand with them. In the event of a disaster uh, or in the event of an attack on either of us, then yes, we will come to each other's assistance, uh, including uh, with military assistance. In the end, the war in Ukraine prompting Finland, even with its 50,000 shelters, to decide it can no longer go it alone, and likely giving Putin the very thing he dreaded, NATO's expansion. The United States will defend every inch of NATO territory with the full force of American power. We are a small nation. Uh, we need help. We need friends. NATO might be that, that friend that we need. Fascinating just how prepared they are. Our thanks to Inez for that. Ian Panel joins us once again from Ukraine. And Ian, what do we know about the Russian reaction to Finland possibly joining NATO? Yeah, I mean, a fairly hostile reaction, which is pretty much as predicted. The Russians regard this as obviously NATO expansion, but of course Finland shares a border with Russia. They see this as a direct threat to Russia. Remember that Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin used the pretext of NATO expansion as their justification for the invasion in the first place. Uh, and of course, this kind of only adds grist to Putin's mill. Uh, we're also seeing comments from the deputy UN, the Russian deputy UN ambassador, uh, essentially suggesting that this could potentially expose both of those countries to attacks. Well, of course, if they've joined NATO, then that potentially triggers uh, Article 5, and then we're into a whole world uh, of difficulty and potential conflict with Russia, which of course everyone keeps saying that they don't want. The White House has made it clear it doesn't want that. Uh, and the Kremlin also. But it's interesting, there hasn't been an expansion of NATO in years. It still has to go through a ratification process in both countries' parliaments if Sweden indeed does decide to follow the route uh, of Finland. Bear in mind that both these countries have been neutral for a very long time. Then it has to be agreed by NATO. But if it does go through, it runs the risk of Putin doubling down here and potentially increasing the risk for NATO. Lindsay? 
Our thanks to Ian. And when we come back, the Good Samaritans jumping into action after a woman suffered a medical emergency on a busy South Florida road. The latest on the investigation into the shooting of a prominent Al Jazeera journalist many believe at the hands of Israeli forces. But up next, Diane Sawyer's emotional interview with Ashley Judd about her mother's battle with mental illness that eventually ended in suicide. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck, and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently, and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Talk about the right place at the right time. Look at this woman running into the street, banging on the car window while telling other motorists to steer clear. She was the co-worker of the victim and was originally driving behind the car when she noticed that something was wrong. Within seconds, a group surrounded the car using their strength to stop it from moving. One man later used a dumbbell to break a window. This all took place in Palm Beach County, Florida, and these Good Samaritans likely saved her life. The victim is now trying to track down the people who helped her to say thank you. Now to a deeply personal sit-down interview with Ashley Judd, whose mother, legendary country music superstar Naomi Judd, died 12 days ago after a long battle with mental illness. Ashley invited her own Diane Sawyer to come to her home in Tennessee so she could share not just the struggles of her mother's life, but also the joys. It's so beautiful in the hills of Tennessee where the amazing Judd family has lived in separate houses but minutes apart. And through the years, they've spoken publicly about their challenging family life with a mother who was wounded by trauma and depression but filled with dreams and drive. As we arrived, Ashley waited at the door. Good morning, my fellow Kentuckians. Her grief shared by her sister and the stepfather they call Pop the kind of grief where the darkest heartbreak is framed by the brightest light. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mom loves it. As someone said, 
the size of the loss is the size of the love. Mm. And that can be infinite. And you know, my, I appreciate so deeply and really want to start by thanking everyone for their, for their outpouring of love and condolences. And that um, my sister and I, we have a depth of gratitude. We, we're very, and I also want to address Diane. You know why why we're doing this? And I say, and I say, us. I'm here as an individual sitting with you by myself, but both sister and pop have have sort of deputized me in certain ways to speak on behalf of the family at this early time before things about the 30th of April become public without our control. You know whether it's the autopsy or the exact manner of her of her death. And so that's really the impetus for this timing. Otherwise, it's, it's obviously way too soon. And so that's important for us to, to say up front. Where do you want to begin? Um, there's, there are many places to begin. I think that I would start with um, my mother knew that she was seen and she was heard in her anguish and that um, that she 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 was walked home she was walked home and that there is when we're talking about mental illness it's very important to, and to be clear and to make the distinction between our loved one and the disease it's very real and it's an, it is it is enough to it, it's a, it lies, it's savage, and you know my mother, our mother, couldn't hang on until she was inducted into the Hall of Fame by her peers. I mean that is the level of catastrophe of what was going on inside of her because the 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 barrier between the regard in which they held her couldn't penetrate into her heart. And the lie that the disease told her was so convincing. And it's the lie that you are not... That you're not enough, that you're not loved, that you're not worthy. And, I mean, her, her brain hurt. It, it physically hurt. And I'm tasked with an exceedingly difficult um, task in disclosing the manner of, of um, the way my mother chose not to continue to live. And I've thought about this so much because once I say it, it cannot be unsaid. And so, because we don't want it to be a part of the gossip economy, I will share with you that she used a weapon. Mother used a firearm. So that's the piece of information that we are very uncomfortable sharing, but understand that we're in a position that, uh, you know, if we don't say it, someone else is, is going to. It was a day like another day. It... it was a mixed day. So I, um, I visit with my mom and pop every day when I'm home in Tennessee. So I was at the house visiting as I am every day. And mom said to me, will you stay with me? And I said, of course I will. Ashley went outside to bring in a comforting person who had arrived when she came back. I went upstairs to let her know that the friend was there and I discovered her. I have both grief and trauma from, um, from discovering her. She prays that everyone will honor the rest of the details as private. My mother is entitled to her dignity and her privacy. And so there are, there are some things that we would just like to retain as a family. And so I wanna be very careful when we talk about this today that for anyone who is having those ideas or those impulses, you know, to talk to someone, to share, to be open, to be vulnerable. There is a national suicide hotline. We're 
you walking with your heart in your hand every day? Worried? I, I, I really accepted the love my mother was capable of giving me because I knew she was fragile. So when I walked around the back of their house and came in the kitchen door and she said, there's my darling, there's my baby, and she lit up, I savored those moments. And every time we hugged and she drank me in, I was very present for those tactile experiences because I knew there would come a time when she would be gone, whether it was sooner or whether it was later, whether it was by the disease or another cause. But when the music was playing, Naomi Judd said that going on stage was like getting to fly. Don't you wanna be there by my side? Mom was a brilliant conversationalist. She was a star. She was an underrated songwriter. And she was someone who suffered from mental illness, you know, and had a lot of trouble getting off the sofa. Except to go into town every day to the Cheesecake Factory where all the staff knew and loved her. And I know everything about them because she told me everything about them. Or Dwayne at Walgreens, you know, who needs to get a dog. That's the, the way she was. And she always had $100 bills stuffed in her bra and she was passing them out to the janitorial staff. You know, just an unfailingly kind, sensitive woman. She was very isolated in many ways because of the disease. And yet there were a lot of people who showed up for her over the years, not just me. Including her sister Winona, who sent a letter to share with us. So um, this is from sister and um, we talked a lot about doing this together and what, what she shared is just so her. <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about you today. I love you, four exclamation points. I've been looking at photos of us when we were little. Laugh out loud, good Lord, in capitals. You were such a cutie pie. I laugh and I cry and I thank God we have each other. I need to take some time to process and I need this time to myself. I'm not ready yet to speak publicly about what happened. So I know you understand why I'm not there today. We will do this piece differently. We have each other and I'm grateful we're connected as we walk together through this storm. I just can't, <laughs> I just can't believe she's gone. I'm here, this will take time. I love you, dear sister, I'm proud of you and I'm here whenever you need me. Our thanks to Diane and Ashley Judd for that. And if you're struggling with thoughts of suicide or worried about a friend or a loved one, there is help available. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or text TALK to 741-741 or you can visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org for free confidential emotional support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even if it feels like it, you are not alone. Still ahead here on Prime, the Biden administration gets more involved with the nationwide baby formula shortage, but what, if anything, can the government do? With the success of movies like Crazy Rich Asians and Shang-Chi, we take a closer look at diversity in Hollywood when it comes to the AAPI community. And casinos have been making a lot of money recently. We take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day from Uberfax about Friday the 13th. you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We had this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? 
We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. I'd like to get to the point where I'm considered to be more spiritually influential on this earth than the Pope. I never heard anyone speak so much truth. What is it going to take for you to be happy? I like to think of you who are standing here as my little army around the world. I'd die for this, you know, I would die for this. It's absolutely disturbing. I can misuse my power. I need you to trust that I've got you. The Deep End premieres Wednesday at 10 on Freeform and stream on Hulu. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. A serial killer who knew his victims. A mother who would stop at nothing to find the killer. Now, a never-before-seen prison interview with the killer. I touched him. So and the only surviving victim speaks out. 2020, new Friday on ABC. Welcome back, everyone. You know the expression, the House always wins. Well, in March, the House certainly did just that to the tune of more money than casinos have ever earned in a single month. Let's take a look by the numbers. $5.31 billion, that's the total revenue U.S. casinos reported in March, according to a new report from the American Gaming Association. That's the highest monthly total in the industry's history. $14.31 billion, that was the amount taken in during a record first quarter from January to March. Casinos along Las Vegas' has strip saw massive booms in revenue as well. MGM Resort reported its revenue doubled to $475 million during the first quarter of the year. Sports betting is now a major part of the market. Americans bet $57.7 billion on sports last year, more than twice the amount from 2020 as more states move to legalize betting. $320.9 million, that's the haul that casinos took in from New Yorkers betting on sports in the first quarter of 2020. Sports betting actually wasn't even legal in New York until January 8th. Now the state is America's leading sports betting market. And one note, according to a new report, 4.6 million American women joined sports book betting apps in 2021. The growth rate is higher among women than it is among men. It certainly appears inflation is not having an impact on gambling. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The bloodbath in cryptocurrency markets and the unbelievable losses that have many investors reeling. And we all need a little bit to make us smile. A little levity tonight. Meet the therapy giving gecko. He is tonight's TikTok. But first, to look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. He was strapped into a rocket. Stray is good. I'm good. And soared into outer good space. Oh, my God. And now, Michael Strahan will take you to the land of fire and ice. Live from breathtaking Iceland. The powerful glaciers and shimmering waterfalls. The fiery volcanoes shooting lava 1,000 feet in the sky. The most extreme landscapes on the planet. GMA's extraordinary Earth. First, we made history from Antarctica. Then, live from the amazing beauty of the Galapagos Islands. And now, be prepared to be blown away when you see the wonders of Iceland live. Are you ready for this, Michael? Starting this Tuesday, only on ABC's Good Morning America. What we're going to be doing is what I call channeling. It's an incredibly dangerous process. We hired a private investigator. My job is to try to figure out if this is a cult or not. The people in my life have to be more dedicated to mission. 
you want to come within 50 miles of me, you better be ready for the deepest end of the pool. The Deep End premieres Wednesday at 10 on Freeform and stream on Hulu. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Flags lowered to half staff in a moment of silence on Capitol Hill as the U.S. remembers the one million lives lost to COVID-19. Our heart goes out to all those who are struggling, asking themselves, how do I go out without him? How do I go out without her? Millions grieving the loss of a loved one or friend killed by the virus. And concern growing once again as the country sees a rise in new cases. The president urging Congress to approve funding for more testing and treatments. Hospitalizations at their highest levels since mid-March, increasing in at least 34 states and territories. New details about the nationwide shortage of baby formula. The shortage is due in part to the closure of an Abbott Labs plant in Michigan. Now, Abbott says after FDA approval, it will take up to 10 weeks to get products back on store shelves. President Biden speaking with baby food companies today and tonight, the White House now saying Gerber and Reckitt have now increased baby formula production. A major dive in the cryptocurrency market, more than $200 billion wiped out from the market in just 24 hours, according to CoinMarketCap. The hit starting with the collapse of the TerraUSD stablecoin, Terraform Labs, the company behind TerraUSD and the Luna cryptocurrencies, briefly halted trading for two hours today to prevent governance attacks, with Luna's price having fallen by as much as 99%. Bitcoin and Ethereum also saw major Major drops as a result. The investigation continues into the death of an Al Jazeera journalist. The Palestinian Authority rejecting Israel's request for a joint investigation into the death of American Palestinian journalist Shirin Abu Akleh, fatally shot during an IDF raid in the disputed West Bank. Minister Hussein al Sheikh says Ramallah will complete an independent investigation and will not allow Israel to examine the bullet that killed the veteran Al Jazeera reporter. The U.S. condemning her death as a quote affront to media freedom everywhere. Dallas police are trying to find the gunman who opened fire in a hair salon. Dallas Police Sergeant Warren Mitchell says the salon's owner, an employee, and a customer were hit, but all three are expected to recover. Police in Dallas have released an image of the man. They say he fled in a maroon van. The salon is in the Koreatown section of Dallas. All three victims, including the owner, are Korean. There's no word yet on a potential motive for the attack. She's the eight-time Tony nominee known for her show-stopping voice in shows like Gypsy and Evita. But her latest ovation has nothing to do with the part she's playing. Put your mask over your nose. That's why you're in the theater. That is the rule. If you don't want to follow the rule, get the Following Tuesday night's performance in Company, Patti Lapone ripping into an audience member who refused to wear their mask correctly after repeated requests. Who do you think you are if you do not respect the people that are sitting around you? Patrons are made aware of mask policies when buying their tickets. The Telecharge website clearly states everyone in the theater must wear acceptable face coverings at all times. All face coverings must cover the nose and mouth. Guests who do not comply with these protocols will be denied entry or asked to leave the theater. 
Now to our celebration of Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Tonight, we're taking a closer look at the community's representation on stage and on screen. Ashin Singh sat down with Crazy Rich Asians director John Chu and the new stars of Broadway's Aladdin. What's happening, hot stuff? For decades, Asians have often served as punchlines or depicted as caricatures on the silver screen, <laughs> almost exclusively through a white lens. But in recent years, the tide has been turning, both on screen and behind the camera. Pursuing one's passion. How American. The 2018 blockbuster Crazy Rich Asians was an exclamation point. The first studio film with a majority Asian cast and an Asian American lead since the Joy Luck Club premiered 25 years earlier. It was enough for them and for me. Making something like Crazy Rich Asians was so fulfilling. When you're doing something with purpose, you're having the most fun and your creativity is like on fire. I know this much. You will never be enough. But before Crazy Rich Asians, director John M. Chu the son of Taiwanese and Chinese immigrants, was best known for films like G.I. Joe Retaliation and Now You See Me Too. But that all changed while filming the heist thriller. And then I was like, what am I as an artist? What do I want to say now? Chu realized he wanted to say something about cultural identity. And along came the script for Crazy Rich Asians. Did any part of you fear that America might not be ready, even if you were? 100% I didn't think people were ready for that movie. I, that's why I told my team that I wasn't going to make them any money. But at that point, it didn't matter. I was doing this completely for me. But the film, of course, did make money. A lot of money. And it was hailed for its broad spectrum of Asian characters. Now you really should have told me that you're like the Prince William of Asia. That's ridiculous. Much more of a Harry. <laughs> Chu says he's excited about the emergence of fellow Asian American directors like Daniel Kwan and Lulu Wang. This next generation has no fear. These are amazing artists that have so much to say and different things to say, and we're all figure out together. But it's not just the big screen. Asian Americans have also struggled to break through on the Great White Way. Shobha Narayan and Michael Maliakel recently making history. The first ever South Asian leads cast in Broadway's Aladdin. It's been so wonderful to see so many brown skinned children come to the show and really be at the edge of their seat because they see themselves represented for the first time on stage. But the journey hasn't been easy. It's hard to dream what you can't see, really. I had this passion, this love for music, but didn't see anyone that looked like me doing it. The story is particularly special for the duo because of its ties to their Indian heritage. The fictional world of Agrabah bears resemblances to the Middle East and South Asia. It makes you feel like you belong, like the stories being told involve you. So what's your message for the next generation of Asian kids hoping to take a career in Broadway? You deserve to take up these spaces. Don't set limits on yourself and believe in yourself because if you don't, who will? Our thanks to Ashin for that. And we turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we interview some of our favorite TikTokers to take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Have you ever reached out to a friend, family member, or even a coworker for advice, but they were just too busy to talk? Well, tonight's guest could potentially help solve your problems. Joining us now is Lyle, dubbed on the internet, and to his two million fans, there he is, Therapy Gecko, best known for talking to strangers on his TikTok and on his podcast and pseudo-therapy sessions, all while dressed up in this famous reptile costume. Lyle, so good to have you on the show. Before we talk to you, let's take a look at some of your interactions with fans. I wanted to get your opinion on something that people have judged me for my whole life. I sometimes hop in the shower with my socks on. I don't know why, I really like the sensation. Would you try something like that? No. But it doesn't matter if I would because, you know, you don't need my approval, you don't need your friend's approval, you need your own approval. It sounds like you've given yourself your own approval. Giving people permission to do what feels good for them. Lyle, welcome to the show. Let's start with the concept of your podcast. What exactly is Therapy Gecko? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. The podcast, it's about, uh, uh, it, it's not so much about therapy or about advice or about making people feel good or about making people feel bad. It's really, uh, at its core, about being a gecko and talking to people on the phone. 
And, and you make it very clear to your listeners and viewers that you're not a licensed therapist, yet people no. still call in. What do you think it is about you and the costume, the whole getup, that, that people feel so comfortable sharing their stories with you? Well, I think that there's a thing about, uh, uh, you know, people are more comfortable sharing things with thousands of strangers on the <laughs> internet than they are with people in their real life yeah. because they will feel a little bit less judged. And, you know, I, I'm sort of, I'm not even like a person. I'm like a, a weird lizard guy. Like when you're talking to a person, like you get the sense that they're gonna like judge you or that they're like perceiving you in a way. But it's kind of the same way how people like will spill all their feelings out to their dog because their dog, <laughs> you know, it will keep all of their secrets. I feel like that's how people feel about, uh, you know, mysterious online gecko guy. Many of your videos feature callers who share peculiar stories like the lady who said she likes to shower with her socks on. Is there ever yeah. a time where you just don't know what to say? All the time. Most of the time I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I think I've accidentally given off this impression that, you know, I'm here to advise or that I have some <laughs> kind of answers, but that's totally not true. I, I'm more interested in kind of talking them through whatever is going on and having them kind of just like take all the thoughts in their head and, and spill them out there and you know find some value in that more than I am in uh, finding some kind of solution or, or answer to whatever is happening. And that probably is what the key is. People just really need to talk and need someone, something yeah. in your case, to, to hear them out. After the therapy sessions are over and you take the suit off, wipe away the green face paint, who is Lyle? Are, are these ses sessions uh, therapeutic for you as well? Uh, weird, I almost feel like I'm like blacked out the whole time. Like I don't remember anything from the sessions. There's a very clear line between uh, uh, who I am as a gecko and who I am when I'm not a gecko. All right, well Lyle, so good to have you on the show. We really appreciate you joining our TikTok segment this week. You can listen to Lyle's therapy sessions wherever you stream your podcast. I wore green just for you today. Match the oh, gecko. thank you, I'm honored. <laughs> Looks great. <laughs> thank you, Lyle. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. What you're looking at is the first ever picture of a black hole at the center of our galaxy. The Event Horizon Telescope collaboration released the image today of the black hole known as Sagittarius A. It's about 27,000 light years away, and it took eight telescopes in order to capture these images. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, honoring the one million lives lost to COVID. And we'll speak to a former NATO ambassador about Finland's announcement that it wants to join NATO. Stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download Load it now. A serial killer who knew his victims. A mother who would stop at nothing to find the killer. Now the only surviving victim speaks out. The new 2020 Friday night on ABC. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. 
Christopher Steele. The guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A wildfire blazed across Southern California, destroying nearly two dozen homes in the town of Laguna Niguel on Wednesday. A record drought has left wild brush extremely dry, and that fueled the fast-moving fire. A large swath running across the Midwest from Kansas to Minnesota is a, quote, enhanced risk of possible tornadoes that could bring damaging winds and large hail. Meanwhile, much of the U.S. could suffer record heat tomorrow with temperatures in the 80s and 90s from Texas to Maine. It could even top 100 degrees in Laredo, Texas. Kentucky Derby winner Rich Strike will not run in the Preakness later this month, meaning for the fourth consecutive year, horse racing will not have a triple crown winner. Owner Rich Dawson wants the, to rest the horse in order to prepare for the Belmont Stakes in New York on June 11th. Rich Strike at 80 to 1 was the biggest long shot to win the Derby in more than a century. Now to the sobering milestone here in the United States. One million lives lost to COVID. Behind every number, a family changed forever. And for every four COVID deaths in this country, one child has lost a parent or a primary caregiver. That's more than 250,000 children. World News Tonight anchor David Muir introduces us to the resilient orphans of COVID. 5.30 in the morning, AJ Ariano arrives at school football practice in honor of his... Just know that he's watching me. It helps me with playing better, you know? 5.45 a.m., Trey Burrows is about to leave for work. This is, like, actually happening to us. 6 a.m., his sister Jenny up two. They are now raising their two sisters, hoping to make their mother proud. On this day, Jenny gets the girls to school. Across this country, the young people showing their resilience. Kylie Coney walking down the hallway in high school. Everything happened so suddenly and so fast. Her brother Colton with his backpack. Life without their dad. Cornelia Bell getting on the school bus, a first grader, now without her mother and her father. Four-year-old Elsie, two-year-old Graham, out the door before the sun comes up, barely old enough to remember their father. For months now, we have witnessed the quiet strength of the children facing a new day without a parent. More than 250,000 children here in the U.S. have lost a parent or a primary caregiver in this pandemic. Kylie and Colton's dad was always so proud. All right, Colton! A big birthday girl. On this day in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, Colton is about to honor his father. You got a big game today, huh? Yeah. Are you nervous? Uh, a little bit. Your dad was a big hockey guy. Yeah. What's been the hardest part for you? Not being able to see him every day. Like, it was always good waking up and seeing him. His sister Kylie, down the hall. Do you find yourself still talking to your dad? Sometimes I'll text him, and I think that that helps me. It's kind you of, still text him? Yeah, it's like my way of communicating. It is bittersweet because I know I'm not going to get a reply back. The sunset she sent her father. What did he say? Thank you for the beautiful sky. I miss you. Oh. Yeah. Did you know your mom has been doing the same thing? No, I did not. <laughs> yep. You caught me. A mother in the hallway listening. I started sleeping on his side of the bed because I couldn't bear rolling over at night and seeing that empty spot. And in the morning, you know, tell him I'm ready to start the day and do the best that I can as, as a mom, and then I'll take care of our kids. May he be proud. I hope, I hope so, yeah. Upstairs, Colton getting ready for hockey. His father's Rangers hat right there on Colton's dresser. And his father's pins, his rings. His father was a Marine. One of his favorite hats, and then pins and necklaces and rings from the Marines. I heard you got his flag. Yeah. 
that a tough moment? Yeah, definitely. We hear about the numbers, but rarely do we see the moment a child says goodbye to their parent. Please accept this flag as a token of appreciation for your loved ones faithful and all of your service. Colton was just 12, his hand reaching for his father's flag. Happy birthday, dear Their father, Eric Coney, died at just 51. He and his wife both had COVID. And Eric died the day they got the call saying the vaccines were now available for them. Colton now heads out the door for the hockey game his father would have loved. How are the pregame nerves? Uh, a little nervous. A little nervous? Um, All right. His mother on the other side of the fence. One, two, three, go. Let's go, let's go. In Boynton Beach, Florida, Trey Burroughs and his siblings starting another day without their mother. I wake up at 5.30, take a shower, and then hopefully I have a little bit of time to read my Bible and eat a bit of food. I'm studying to become a firefighter. Cindy Dawkins, a single mother of four, died from COVID. She had been afraid of the vaccine. Once I got the news, which was over the phone, um, like obviously I cried and I was super sad. And my mind went to my sisters, how are we gonna like make sure we all stay together. Found out she had COVID one day, the next day she was gone. Jenny and her brother Trey are now the parents. We're making good time this morning. She fixes Sierra's makeup. Okay, perfect. Zoe getting ready too. Becoming parents has been difficult. I had a hard time admitting that I felt kind of guilty because I felt very Like tired, stressed out, just wanting to be by myself sometimes. It is okay. Yeah. And who's looking out for you? <sighs> Honestly, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And in our months following these children, we noticed something else. Every day, Jenny and her mother's necklace. I don't feel right not wearing it. I've worn it every day since I got it from the hospital, so. She was wearing that when she went to the hospital? Yeah, yeah. This is the first thing that they handed to me. And ever since then, I've had it. Every one of these children carries their parent with them. It's 5 a.m. and A.J. Ariano is up. He knows that's what his father would have wanted. Okay. He's off to football practice. So it's 524 in the morning. His father, Alan, was just 49. He'd had his first shot of the vaccine, and he was waiting on the second. Part of why you're here is your dad, right? Yeah, definitely. Do you think about him every day? Every day, especially when I wake up. It's been nine months now without his father. Before every game, you go to the sideline? Yeah, right over there. And what do you do? Well, I say a little prayer, and I talk to my dad just like I would. Before every game, he'd give me a, he'd give me a phone call, so I just act like I'm on the same phone call, and I just hear him talking back with me. We still hear his voice. Yeah, definitely. On the Shakta Reservation in Mississippi, Take your phones. the scope of the loss Bye -bye. is devastating. The little girl who lost both parents, Mylindy Bell, now raising her seven-year-old niece, Cornelia Jaros. Where's your jacket and your mask? Her parents, Craig and Mindy Bell, died just three months apart, both getting COVID before the vaccines were ready. That's Menendi in the blue jacket, and that's Tashta in the black jacket. They're my mom and daddy, but they died. <sighs> and my Lindy is about to bring her niece to the COVID memorial on the reservation. They made this cross for those that passed from COVID. So like Mamo and your mama, they did this in honor of them. Let's honor me. Like, 
honoring people, you know, because they've passed. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians dedicated to those, the lives of those lost to the COVID-19 pandemic. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. As we document these families, the turning points. Feeling so excited. Six months after losing their mother, they are now packing. With their two jobs and money raised by a mom from school, Janie Yoshida on GoFundMe, they are now about to move into their first house, their mother's dream. She always wanted a house for us, so I know she's probably ecstatic right now. So you made dinner already for tonight. Yes, So sure. what is dinner? Um, baked chicken and rice, white rice. I might have to stay a little longer. <laughs> as part of his training, we watch as Trey returns from a call with the Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue Station 65. And we go to find him after the test. So how'd it go? Yeah, you passed the first one? Yes, sir. You feeling good? Yeah. All right. The smile says it all. <laughs> Turning points for all of the families. Cornelia about to make the honor roll. Cornelia J. Rose Bay. and the speech Kylie is about to give for her father. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kylie Coney. Going back to school was and still is the most challenging thing I ever had to conquer. This year, my brother decided to join hockey. We are slowly learning to find happiness in our lives again. Perhaps sharing can let other families know, let other children know that they are not alone. Thank you. Such resilience. Our coverage of one million deaths continues tomorrow and throughout the week right here on ABC News Live. Next tonight, to the dramatic escalation in the investigation of the Capitol riot, the House committee has now issued subpoenas to five Republican congressmen, including GOP leader Kevin McCarthy, who says the probe is not legitimate. Jonathan Carl reports. In a highly confrontational and virtually unprecedented move, the January 6th committee today subpoenaed five Republican members of Congress, including GOP leader Kevin McCarthy, who could soon become the Speaker of the House. All five had refused to cooperate. McCarthy unwilling to testify about the phone conversations he had with President Trump while the attack on the Capitol was underway. Back on January 6th, McCarthy told ABC News that he pleaded with Trump to give a national address calling on his rampaging supporters to stand down. I, I, I begged him to go talk to the nation. Four days after the riot, McCarthy was caught on tape telling fellow Republicans he'd had it with Trump. I've, I've had it with this guy. Uh, what he did is unacceptable. Um, nobody can defend that and nobody should defend it. But soon after, McCarthy was back to being one of Trump's staunchest supporters as he is today. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl for that. Now to the major move by Russia's neighbor Finland. After years of neutrality, it made moves today to join the most powerful alliance in the world, NATO. In a statement, the president of the country said NATO membership would strengthen Finland's security. Finland must apply for NATO membership without delay. Russia responded to Finland's announcement, threatening to take retaliatory steps to stop threats to its national security. With us now to discuss Finland's announcement that it hopes to join NATO is Lieutenant General Douglas Lute, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO. General Lute, thanks so much for joining us. Finland's leaders today called for applying for NATO membership, quote, without delay, if they join, along with Sweden as expected. How would this change the security panorama in Europe and in the wider North Atlantic? Well, such a move would be a win-win for Finland and Sweden as nations because they gained the um, whole life insurance policy of NATO membership. Uh, that is the full benefit of Article 5, which essentially says that any attack on, on one member would be considered by all the other members as an attack on them. So an attack on one is an attack on all. So they gain a lot. NATO itself would gain a lot. By, uh, by welcoming these two new members. Uh, first of all, they would represent an anchor uh, in the sensitive and critical Baltic Nordic region, sort of the northeast corner of the alliance. And the alliance would gain two very well-established democracies with meaningful military capabilities. So it's a win-win for the countries and for the alliance. The only loser in this equation is Vladimir Putin, who of course has achieved what he said he wanted to reverse, which is the enlargement of NATO.
And on the same day as Finland's announcement, former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev posted on Telegram that NATO, by sending weapons to Ukraine and training its troops, is increasing the chances of a direct conflict between NATO and Russia, risking what he said, quote, would be a full-fledged nuclear war. What do you make of those comments? Well, first of all, the United States and others who are helping Ukraine are actually following um, the precepts of the UN Charter all the way back to 1945, which says that every country has a right to defend itself and the UN members have the, the right, in fact, the responsibility to help them in such a defense. Uh, so we're completely on the in the right uh, with regard to our support in Ukraine. And, and furthermore, the US and our partners who are supporting Ukraine have taken careful steps not to overdo the support and not to provide provocative um, levels of support, but rather to give Ukraine the required, uh, the required uh, capability to defend itself. And many experts have said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was meant to tamp down on Ukraine's ambitions to join NATO. Now we have likely two new NATO members right up along Russia's border. How does that make NATO allied countries safer if it further provokes Russia? Well, it, it, the, the pretext all along that President Putin offered with regard to the attack on Ukraine about NATO membership was a phony pretext from the outset. Uh, and, and what he's proven to countries like uh, Finland and Sweden, who are outside the alliance, uh, the alliance protection, is that they require uh, membership in the alliance to protect themselves. He has demonstrated uh, that uh, in, in the first major attack on a European country since 1945, he's demonstrated the essence of NATO and why NATO is so important. So he's actually delivered to himself exactly what he said at the beginning he wished to avoid. It, what's the path to de-escalation of this conflict at this point? Well, it's difficult to see because if you look at the two protagonists, the two warring parties, Ukraine and Russia, it doesn't appear yet that they have sufficient overlapping grounds for some sort of a diplomatic solution, some sort of compromise. You see uh, Ukraine actually gaining momentum, as your, as your correspondent reported, gaining momentum in parts of the battlefield, and yet Russia is gaining in other parts of the battlefield. Neither side has yet exhausted um, the battlefield dynamic. And, and until that's done, uh, I don't see room for a diplomatic outcome. Lieutenant General Douglas Lute, we thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. And still to come, the plane that burst into flames while taking off at a Chinese airport. And when you should and shouldn't trust your gut. We'll talk about it coming up. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A Tibet Airlines flight overshot the runway and burst into flames while taking off from an airport in Chongqing, southwest China. There were no deaths and only minor injuries among the 113 passengers and nine crew members, according to the airline. The Spanish Coast Guard rescued 183 migrants off the coast of the Canary Islands early this morning. Every year, thousands of people leave North Africa to attempt the dangerous crossing to Europe. Last year, some 4,400 people People were lost at sea attempting to reach Spain, according to a monitoring group. Last Sunday, 44 people trying to reach the Canary Islands perished when their wooden boat capsized. The families of eight missing minors in Burkina Faso are awaiting news from rescue teams as efforts continue to locate the men who've been stuck underground for 26 days. There's been no communication with the miners since they were trapped more than 1,600 feet below ground during a flood at the zinc mine on April 16th. Families hope the men have reached a rescue chamber stocked with food and water. Rescue teams were nearing the chamber on Thursday, according to a mine spokesperson. We've all heard the old adage, go with your gut, but our next guest, data scientist Seth Stevens Davidowitz, argues that actually may not be the best bet in his new book, Don't Trust Your Gut, Using Data to Get What You Really Want in Life. Seth, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks so much for having me. So it, it sounds like your basic premise, your thesis statement here is, don't go with your gut. Why is that? Yeah, people don't like hearing that because a lot of people love going with their gut. But I'm just saying there's a lot of data out there to help you make better decisions. And frequently, a lot of people get make bad decisions when they follow their intuition. They don't really think it through, uh, think through what the data is out there on all kinds of big topics uh, that I cover in the book. And, and so how does one determine what the relevant and reliable data points would be when they're making a decision? Uh, you basically have to read my book because that, that gives you all the reliable data on all the topics. But I go through all the big ones. So, for example, if you want to know if you're picking a partner, uh, there are actually studies now that have studied studied more than 11,000 couples, and they've seen what predicts uh, romantic happiness, uh, which couples end up happy. And it turns out there are certain traits about a partner that are more predictive. Uh, if your partner has a growth mindset, conscientiousness, satisfied with life. Uh, not the things we try to date on. We always try to date someone who's beautiful or tall or uh, has a sexy occupation, but the things that actually predict long-term happiness are very different. And you also talk about these really unexpected correlations, these various uh, points that you can look at. For example, you took uh, an idea of what makes a great parent, and then you looked at their tax records. What's the relationship there? Yeah, so they've studied uh, in tax records when kids grow up in different neighborhoods, uh, what happens, how do the kids turn out? And growing up in certain neighborhoods like Seattle, uh, Washington, Madison, Wisconsin, certain others, kids who grew up there turn out to do way better in life. Uh, so it shows the power of a neighborhood. Uh, really, one of the most, probably the most important decision any parent makes is where to raise their kids. Mm -hmm. And there's actually data now that can tell parents where to do this. And that's separate from how much income the family has, is that yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's the same, it's parents, the same parents, but di siblings grew up in different places. So you kind of take into account everything else, but one sibling grew up in Denver and one sibling grew up in Seattle. And the one that grew up in Seattle just en ends up on average doing much better. And I guess that many people are going to say, well, you know, this is a battle between maybe your head and, and your heart, your instinct, right? And so how does science really come into play? Yeah, I, I don't, you... I'm not saying you should totally ignore what you feel or I'm not saying just listen to this and tomorrow move to Seattle. <laughs> uh, obviously, there's a lot that goes into play where your family is, where your friends are, where your job is. But you should just have more, it just, it's always good to have more information. And this inf information is now available. It's all publicly available. You can learn all these things. And it can just allow you to be, make more informed decisions uh, rather than having this information hidden from you, which it has been previously. And you talked about this in relationship when you're choosing a spouse. Is your takeaway essentially from this book that we're just using entirely the wrong data points oftentimes to make our big life decisions? Yeah, certainly in dating, I think a lot of people are drawn. We're, we're drawn to qualities that if you look at the actual long-term happiness, they don't make people happy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so anything that, for example, uh, people are more likely, I was shocked to find this, to match with someone in online dating, 11.3% more likely if they share the same initials as them. Yeah. So, like if someone has, a, your, your initials are SS, their initials are SS, you're like, yeah, yeah, I swipe right. Well, in the long term, sharing initials is not going to make you happy. Right. So that just kind of proves how irrational we can be. And we're drawn to these qualities that aren't really qualities that are going to lead to long-term happiness. I'm going to start looking more to the science than my gut. So <laughs> thank you, Seth, for this. And don't trust your gut using data to get what you really want in life is available now wherever books are sold. And still to come, the neighbors who lived in a community that was not getting enough media coverage, and they decided to take matters into their own hands. It's our own local lowdown coming up. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. A spotlight on an underrepresented community in an effort to tell the story of their friends, family, and neighbors. A group of Bangladeshi immigrants started what is now a widely circulated Bangladeshi newspaper, a project that began in Queens. Safan Kim from our partner station WABC brings us this front page story in tonight's local lowdown. That owner and me, we came at the same time in this uh -huh. country. I think late 80s. Yeah. All of a sudden, everything grew up so fast. Mohammed Hossein arrived in Jackson Heights before this swath of Queens became what it is today. These are all Bangladeshi. Sonali Bank is the largest Bangladesh national bank. The largest bank in Bangladesh, first branch in America, is right here. Right. He came to this country almost 40 years ago on a four and a half hour boat ride from the Bahamas to Miami. His first job paid $2.37 an hour. He worked in retail, drove a cab, eventually got two jobs working in hotels. In fact, from the day he arrived in this country, he has always worked two jobs at once. But he's been unemployed since before the pandemic. For me, it's okay because I could support my family back home. Right. I could support my my kids right. and I could give them the education. Underneath the story of struggle is the story of resilience. Her father and me, we start writing Handwriting, handwriting, and we did the photocopy. In 1993, Hossein helped launch the Tikana newspaper with a quarter million readers throughout the New York City tri-state area. It is the most widely circulated Bangladeshi newspaper in North America, on top of readers' minds these days. Unemployment. You use the word survive. What are they surviving from? So um, they're surviving from, you could say one of the aspect is racism. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit racism everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Soraya Rahman is an immigration attorney. Well, they might be receiving wages under you know under minimum wage mm -hmm. they might be sharing an apartment with many people just so they can save money um, and send it back home to their family these are all Bangladeshi I think Bangladeshi a little more spicy spice. but beneath the story of struggle and resilience is also a story of hope and joy the next generation can keep smiling <laughs> because of sacrifices made by immigrants like Hossein 
Our thanks to Safan for that. And that's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news.